<laughs> let's start by just doing the antiderivative of this thing and then we'll plug in the top minus plug in the bottom so this isn't FTC yet this is kind of just a review question in fact why don't you take the antiderivative of those three pieces taking an antiderivative of a polynomial increase the power by one divide by a new power plug in the top minus plug in the bottom that's easy peasy hopefully next let's find the derivative of the above integral okay so the derivative of this thing that we just found right because this is what we just found that's all this so let's take the derivative of each piece of that um, so let's just go across the front row here different corner Natalie what's the derivative of x to the fourth Samantha, the derivative of x squared. Two. Joseph, the derivative of negative 3x. Uh, three. Negative, three. negative 3. And Evelyn, the derivative of negative 365. Mm -hmm. Zero. Got the easy one. But it's important. People forget that one sometimes. Okay, let's pause here and look at what we just did. We took the derivative of an antiderivative. Like, wait a minute, those should cancel each other out, right? Like the derivative of an antiderivative, shouldn't that just cancel each other out? And it, it kind of canceled each other out. So the question is, um, examine your answer to the above question. How does it relate to the integrand? There's the integrand, there's the answer. How would you say those two things are related to each other? How does this compare to this? Go ahead. It's the obvious answer. It's the same. same. It's, the same it's almost the same thing, right? It's it's sort of the same. What what's different about it? Yeah, we we replace the t with an x. Replace the t with an x. Okay, next question. What, well, let's pause here for a second, though. I, surely that kind of makes sense because we took the derivative of an antiderivative. Those are supposed to cancel each other out, so it makes sense that those are at least related to each other. Does the lower limit of integration, the 5, have any effect on the answer? Let's kind of trace through here. There's the 5. There's the 5. There's all the 5 stuff. There's the 5 stuff. The derivative of the 5 stuff was 0. So what's the answer to this question? No. It didn't matter. Because we took a derivative, like we did all this work, we took a derivative of a constant, and so it became 0. It didn't really matter what the constant was. Derivative of a constant equals 0. So it, did, it didn't matter. If there's a constant there, its derivative is zero. Okay, well let's use that pattern to answer this question. The derivative of the antiderivative. Okay, so the, the trick is to slow down when you're doing these problems. Don't jump in and start start looking and be like, oh man, I gotta find the antiderivative of that. I don't know how to do that. Um, yeah, I don't either. Well, I do, but it's complicated. But that's not what it's asking us. It's asking us to do the derivative of the antiderivative. You're like, okay, that's an easier problem to do. That just means all i got to do is plug in the x for t and get my answer. So that would be 3 over x squared plus 3x. All right, so I didn't actually have to do the antiderivative and the derivative, I just sort of replaced what was going on there. Uh, it's a little reminiscent, looking for a scratch piece of paper. When I taught Algebra 1, I would always put this question on the test when we were doing square roots. Um, so without a calculator, I would ask them to find the square root of 17.89 squared. <laughs> I know, it's a rough one. 
but for some Algebra 1 students, they're like, oh, man, 17.89 times 17.89. And then they get some weird answer, and they're like, man, I don't know how to take the square root of that. Like, yeah, I know, but the square root of the squared, that's kind of the same thing that's going on here. I don't really take an antiderivative of this. I realize that those two things cancel each other out, and all i got to do is plug in the x. That's why it's called the derivative and the antiderivative. They cancel each other out. Maybe we should call this the, the anti-square function. The anti-square of the square gets us back to 17.89. All right, hopefully that was way overkill to make this point. Second example, again, all i got to do, recognize what's going on, the derivative of the antiderivative. So that's just a cancel out situation. e to the cosine of 5x. Then that's it. Now, if you're wondering if there's a trick coming, yes. Yes, there is. Because, of course, there is. Um, with the first fundamental theorem of calculus, let's put this up at the top. FTC 1.0. Remember, that was the antiderivative of the derivative. It gets us back to F. But we had to be concerned about the limits, so the top minus the bottom. That was the little extra piece to this. Yeah, they cancel each other out, but there's a little extra thing going on. Same thing here. They cancel each other out, but there's an extra thing going on. So I'm going to just give you the answer to this problem, and you tell me if you can figure out what the extra thing going on is. The answer is plug in the 3x squared, so 5 times 3x squared plus 1. And then this times 6x appears at the end. Does that look familiar? Is that we've got a name for that? What, what is that called? The chain That's the chain rule. So because we're taking a derivative, we'll have to do the chain rule of whatever we plug in. Yeah, you could prove this self to your <laughs> to yourself at home if you really wanted to. Like if you wanted to take the antiderivative of this, plug in the top, plug in the bottom, and then take the derivative, you would get this. But why go through that? You're going to trust me most likely. All right. Well, what if the lower boundary is not a constant? So derivative of the antiderivative, those cancel each other out. So I'm going to plug in the top thing uh, times the chain rule. But the chain rule off of what we're plugging in, right? So the chain rule of sine of x, not the chain rule of anything else going on. So times cosine of x minus, just like we always do, plug in the bottom one. So e to the x squared. What's the chain rule of x? 1. So that would be a, that'd be a place where if we forgot it, it would be OK. This sort of is related, not sort of, it is related to this. If the bottom's a constant, it doesn't matter. Because the chain rule of a constant, what's the derivative of 7 or pi? zero so that would wipe out the second part so you you can always think of doing top minus bottom as long as you remember to multiply by the chain rule which will sometimes wipe out part of it so this is going to look crazy because we got all these letters in here the derivative of the antiderivative okay so those are going to cancel each other out but the trick is plug in the top minus plug in the bottom so f of g of x chain rule, though, what am I multiplying by the derivative of? The chain rule of f or the chain rule of g? Which one? Of g. So g prime minus the derivative of the bottom one, or excuse me, minus plug in the bottom one, so f of h of x 
times the derivative of the bottom one. So that's the big rule that works all the time. So if, you're, if your bottom thing is not h of x, but it's a constant, then this h prime would be 0, and it would wipe that out. That's how we like it to appear, because that just makes life a little easier. But if there's something down there, we handle it the same way we always do. Plug in the top, minus plug in the bottom. But the extra thing for FTC 2.0 is the chain rule business. Don't forget the chain rule. OK, average rate of change is what we're going to worry about tomorrow. So we can pass on that for now. Don't mark it out, because we'll come back to it. Let's flip over and do the, the FTC example problems. So number one. <clears throat> Again, slow down, otherwise you end up working a long problem. You start trying to figure out, oh man, i got to take the integral of the square root of 1 plus t squared. And then after I do that, I have to take the derivative of it. Like, no, no, slow down. This is, again, the, this is the square root of 17.89 squared problem. It's, <laughs> there's a hard way and an easy way. Let's do it the easy way. And the easy way is plug in the top number. Then derivative of the top number, which is 1. I, I'm going to do it. You're going to figure out that you don't need to do this every time. And that is, if I plug in the bottom no one, the bottom thing, I, I can do that. But what else do I need to remember to do if I'm going to go this route? What's the chain rule? What's the derivative of 3? 0. So it wipes that piece out. So if you like want to follow the exact formula every single time, plug in the top, chain rule. Minus plug in the bottom, chain rule. After a while, probably after this problem, you're like, look, if it's a constant down there, I'm not doing this. That's a waste of my time. And it is, but I want you to understand why you can skip it. The reason you can skip it is the derivative of 3 is 0, so you don't have to worry about it like number 2 here, I could plug in 4 and then multiply by the derivative of 4, but peek ahead, I don't need to do that. Why don't you try number 2? So there's the answer. Plug in the top times the derivative of the top. You don't have to worry about the bottom because it's a constant, so its derivative would be 0 and it would wipe out the second half. Now number 3, neither of these are constants. So this is going to be a plug in the top minus plug in the bottom problem. So why don't you try number three? Plug in the top. Don't forget the chain rule. Plug in the bottom. Don't forget the chain rule. And that's a safe stop. In fact, I'm not sure you could clean it up a whole lot more than that anyway. Number four, the constant's in the top. So that's going to lead to a 0 minus, and then the same thing, plug in the bottom, cube root 1 plus cosine of x squared times chain rule. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. And that's a safe stop, but that's also a pretty clean up. A pretty easy cleanup job because the, the two negatives would cancel. And I think I'd write the sign in front. Sine of x times the cube root of 1 plus cosine squared of x. Equally valid answers. Safe stop. Multiple choice. But that's the same. All right, number five is worded kind of funny, but it's the same thing. If g of x is this antiderivative, what is g prime? Well, that means I need to take the derivative of all of this. g prime means take the derivative of g. But now I'm taking the derivative of an antiderivative. So I'll plug in x, and I, I guess that's my answer.
right? I can do times one. If I want to really, and then minus f of one times zero. So yeah, all of that becomes f of x. Because the derivative of an antiderivative gets us back to the original. FTC 1.0, antiderivative comes first. Antiderivative of a derivative gets us back to the original. FTC 2.0, the derivative of the antiderivative gets us back to the original. On the first one, you got to be careful about limits. On the second one, you got to be careful about chain rule. All right, we'll stop there and say the assignment is worksheet three, numbers one through one through six. Okay, that's a relatively easy assignment because all you're doing is plug in the top, minus plug in the bottom. Don't forget the chain rule. So take the easy route. Don't do the the failing freshman in algebra one trying to square 17.89 and then take the square root of whatever that is. Right? Use the fact that they cancel each other out.